Oh, you know, you know, I passed that today when I was coming uh, down the motorway. And there, there are lots of lights on the, on in that place now as well, aren't there? Has it been sold or something? Um, it's that even College Nursing now. Oh, right. Oh, of course it is. Yeah, of course it is. Okay, right. So you've got a story to tell us about that. Well, I used to be an ex-patient in there, actually. Right. While I was in there, up on one of the wards, I used to sleep in an annex, in part of the annex. One night while I was asleep in there, I felt a cold shiver going down my spine. Looked up, there was nothing there. Looked again, I could see a glow on one of the other beds. And I just got out, went down the corridor, mm. one of the corridors, because that place is maze with corridors. Right. Went out for a walk down the corridors, and I felt this shiver following me. Mm. And it... It really frightened me, it did. Because it used to be an ex-prisoner prisoner of war camp. Right. With Manor Park and Glenside. You know. So pretty, it was that pretty spooky experience then? Yeah. And did you ever see anything else, or was it just that one occasion? I've seen a few things up there, but oh. there apparently there's a, a woman called the Grey Lady, which haunts Glenside. Really? Wow. Okay. Good story, that. An interesting one. I'm going to give you six for the story and six for the storytelling, because I think you've put that over rather well. So thank you for that. Keep listening. Okay. Thanks for the story. Interesting stuff. All right, let's go to, um, I think we've got Evelyn on the line now. Hi, Evelyn. Good evening to you. Oh, good evening. Good evening. You got a story for us? <laughs> yes. Go on, then. Um, well, this is a true story. Okay. It happened at Christmas, and it happened to me. Right. It was only a week before Christmas 1981. The weather, bitterly cold but dry. The sort of weather when you say it's too cold to snow. And many people feel they would rather be home by the fire mm. than shopping <coughs> for last minute presents, and which you couldn't get if you left it any later. Right. So with my final purchase safely wrapped, my shopping finished, and my arms aching, I had my usual hot cup of tea at the Merry Rocks Cafe <clears throat> before the bus journey home. Although it was late afternoon, the streets and shops seemed to have plenty of people around. And as I walked through the swing glass doors and along to the lift, I was surprised no one was waiting to be taken down to the bus station. Feeling relieved I would not have to negotiate the many twisting metal stairs down, I thankfully pressed the button. After only seconds, I could hear the hum of the lift heralding its approach. And when the doors slid back, there was no one to get out. <coughs> so dumping my bag on the ground and pressing the button the descent down began in next to no time the familiar slight jolt was felt as it touched down and half turning I bent down to pick up my bag and it was then that I noticed with a shock that I, <coughs> I was not alone Ooh. standing right in the back corner was a little lady. Surprise must have shown on my face as we looked at each other because she gave me such a sweet smile but made no attempt to move. I realized the now open doors would soon close again and I stepped out quickly as possible then turned round only to see that she had not done so and the lift doors had closed again. The platform was empty, except for a few school children climbing on the guardrails at the top end and a few more at the bottom end. Feeling puzzled and not at all frightened, I realized that in a flash I had mentally noted her description. Short, plump and 60-ish, wearing a grey coat and closely fitted grey knitted hat. She certainly looked very flesh and blood, but she was not in the lift when I got in. Mm. There was only one stop to go, and she had not got out. So, was she? Could she be? 
I straight got a lift with a nice harmless ghost and as any other shopper going home on a cold winter day being warmed by the kindly smile of a little old lady in grey who likes to travel Oh, that's a great story, and it's true as well. It's true. That's quite true. <laughs> that's lot. That's brill. Did, did you feel frightened, or did, was it just kind of... Uh, no, I felt... didn't. Yeah, I didn't feel weird, at all it? frightened. Right. That's often the case, isn't it, as well with these things, that people don't, and it, it's kind of just, it feels normal. Yes. Weird. Well, that's a great story. I'm going to give you seven for the story and seven for the telling, because I think you told that exceptionally well. Thank you. So I'm you're in the lead. <laughs> oh, no, you were great. That was really good. You're in the lead. Fourteen <laughs> points. Good. Brilliant. Evelyn, keep listening. Thank you for calling. Good. Thank Take you. care. Bye bye. Love it. The next day, he came downstairs, and he told his friends about it, and they all laughed and that. But the dog ha hadn't come back. Oh. But it didn't come back till about three days later. Hmm. But it still wasn't, you know, very happy. Oh. So we don't know what it was then? Nope. Weird. Weird. So were these kind of old tin mines haunted then? Um, it was James Mine or something. Right. My dad just told me. <laughs> oh. Okay, interesting story. Right, we'll give you six for the story and six for the telling, which is 12. <laughs> Good score. Thank you for calling. It's all right. Thanks for the story. Bye-bye. Okay, we're getting spooky tonight. Now, Ivy and Swin has probably switched off by now because these evenings always scare her, and she kind of... She normally hides in the wardrobe. Actually, talking of wardrobes, if you're listening in bed at the moment, have you just kind of checked in the wardrobe just to make sure there's nobody lurking in there? And uh, don't forget to check under the bed as well. Let's go to Dawn in Bath. Might find some dust under there, actually. Hi, Dawn. Hello, Dave. How are you? I'm all right. Okay, you got a story for us? Yeah, this happened, oh, I think I was about six. Yeah. And every Sunday, I used to walk, I think it was about 500 yards down the road, to the news agent, bought my nan her news of the world, mm. and I walked another 100 yards down the road to my nan's house. Right. She was very old, and she used to sort of, like, let me in, pay me the money, and she had to sleep downstairs because she was too ill to go upstairs. Mm -hmm. And everybody joked about her being a witch. And, I mean, she never scared me. She was like, you know, lovely old woman, you know, as far as I was concerned. Mm. And this morning, she said she was feeling very tired. So she gave me the money, took her paper. Um, I tucked her up in bed. She was very ill. She was like, you know, we knew she was going to go, but we didn't know when. Right. I went back home, said she was ill, so Mum went down that afternoon to take her down her um, Sunday roast and, you know, check on how she was. Mm -hmm. And apparently she'd been dead since 8 o'clock the night before. Oh. And she was found cold in her bed. So who let me in? That's a weird story. Who let me in? Who that... gave me... And her newspaper was there. So and is that true? Day. That is true. God, that's amazing. And now, I, I mean, I live in a flat with my boyfriend now, mm. and it is, his mum's here. Yeah. But she's been dead two years. So do you think you... Mm, so you think you can pick up on these sort of people a bit, then? The whole family can. You're all a bit psychic, are you? Apparently. Oh, that's a fabulous... That's a, that's quite an experience, isn't it, really? It was It was scary afterwards, but the but, time well, I wasn't You scared. didn't realise, did you, I guess, no. what was happening? No. Amazing. Well, but apparently, everybody said it's her way of saying goodbye to me, because I was her favourite. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to give you eight for that story, because it's an excellent story, and six for the telling, so that's 14, which puts you jointly in the lead in our story competition tonight so far. Oh. So keep on listening. I will. And thank you for... That's a really amazing story, actually. Thank you, Dawn. Fascinating stuff. If you have just joined us, 27 minutes past 10, it's Thursday's Late Night Live from GWR, and it's our ghost storytelling competition. You can either tell us a true experience that's happened to you that's been a bit spooky, or you can tell us a purely fictional story and we're giving away 10 points for the story and 10 up to 10 points for the telling of the story and the two highest scorers will win some prizes 
And we might give the occasional consolation prize as well. Okay, let's go to Alf on the line now, who's calling us from Bristol. Hi, Alf. Good evening to you. Oh, Dave. How are you? Oh, uh, well, I've been listening to you for well, about five to six months now. Oh, right. I've only got a tele uh, radio. I don't have okay. no television or nothing. Good. And I thought myself, well, I'll give you a tinkle light. you got a story um, for us? It's a, it's a true story. Okay. It happened about, oh, about 25 years ago. Okay. Tell us more. Um, well, what it was, I lived in uh, this big mansion, uh, like a bed 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 set yeah and i had my own little program uh business mm -hmm. and i used to lock the door and i had a uh, answer machine and down in the car park i had a um, cattle truck with a golden labrador in well this particular night i goes up and puts my head down about one o'clock in the morning light the dog starts howling so i thought what's going on so i goes and looks out and as I looked out, there's two dogs. You could hear two dogs howling. So I looked down across and seen my dog. And he was stood in the window with his bristles of his hair, stood right up on end, just howling. So in about 10 minutes after, he calmed down and it all went quiet. So I got myself and that's it. So went on for about an hour and the answer machine clicked. I just heard the answer machine click. Mm. So I didn't take any notice. In the morning, I got up, I got myself with the doors unlocked and ajar. So the door was slightly ajar, which I locked on the night time before. Um, so then I looked at the answer machine, and there was an answer on the machine. And you couldn't understand, it was just the mumbo jumbo. Mm. So after, in the morning, I seen the person that owned it, and I said to him about it. He said, "Well, what what it is?" He said, "The bedroom, the room that you're in, one of the servants used to have a dog, and it used to be down where your lorry's to, in a kennel. And the particular night, the owner died." Oh, <laughs> weird. Yeah. So that was something. Oh, so that, that something was... a bit strange put a message on your answer phone. Yeah. Wow. There was that actually answer machine at mine. It was in a real old one because it's years and years ago. But right. It, there was an actual something on the answer machine. And what was what was it on there? Could you understand? Couldn't it? understand it. What was it? Just an uh... just a, like a mumble. Really? Yeah. Weird. It was. It was. It was a little bit on the frightening side at the time, you know. But um, I've had a couple of experiences because I come from originally in Sherborne and Dorset. Right. There's another one about a woman that crosses the road. And I was walking up the road with a friend of mine, a young kitty, at the pub is shot. And she crossed the road and he just literally jumped up on my back. Oh, I'm a surprise. <laughs> well, good story. Six of the story stick, six of the tellings. That's 12 total, a good total. And uh, thank you for telling it to okay, us. Okay, Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah. Mm. Okay, some good stories coming out tonight. Let's go to Colin now, who's calling us from Knoll. Hi, Colin. Hello, Dave. Hi, you got a story for us. Yes, this is about um, <clears throat> the Wreckers. I don't know if you've ever heard of a mm, thing called the Wreckers. Rings a bell, yeah. Um, I have a, um, a Cornish family. Right. And uh, a lot, awful lot of Cornish people are accused of being Wreckers, which was when they saw a ship in trouble, they would go along with the light and they would guide this ship onto the rocks with their light take them away from the lighthouse, oh. take them away from any landmarks. You know? steal all the cargo? Yes, because ah. as, um, as the law stood then, if there was any survivor, then they could not have any salvage rights. If there was no survivor, then they got the whole salvage, mm. you see. And this story in particular is in Devon. It's the other side of the Tamer anyway. Okay. It's not our side. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. No, of course not. But um, there was this family, there was a father and a son who were professional wreckers and they'd go along the coast whenever there was a, a storm or a gale blown up and they would guide the ships onto the rocks. And this particular time, they'd been doing it for God knows how long, the father had retired and the son had had a daughter who had left, feeling they were quite uh, despicable and things that she'd married an Irish fella. So the daughter, unbeknown to them, was coming back from Ireland. She was on a ship that the son, which was her father, had guided onto the rocks. 
they picked up the survivor, they took him back to her place and left her to die. They came back, she was dead. They hold her up in the wall and as a result, that ghost of that daughter, um, the, the parents of the daughter realized when the, the customs men came in looking for her, realized who she was, they left. Right. And the daughter is supposed to walk this place now. I was just trying to find the literature for you, but I can't. Right. Interesting, though. Well, that's, uh, that's um, quite a sad story, really, isn't it, actually, when it comes down to it? Yeah, but mm. it's, that, that actually is a place in Devon, on the South Devon coast. Right. Brilliant. Well, thanks for that. We'll give you six for the story and seven for the telling, which is 13 points. How many sound effects can you fit on a jingle? OK, welcome back. Thursday's Late Night Live. It's our ghost storytelling competition tonight. Tell us a ghost story, true or fictional, prizes for the best. Uh, it is 10.37 uh, now, and we're going to go to Dave, who's calling us from Western. Hi, Hi Dave. Dave. Hello, Dave. Hello. There you are. Hi. Yeah. Good evening. Got a story Hello. for us. Yeah, um, I live in uh, Whispering Priory. I don't know if you know it. It's near Western Sea from there. Yep. It's an, quite an old place. It's a, it used to be an old monastery back a while ago. Right. And uh, it was Guy Fawkes night one night, and um, we were sitting around a bonfire watching the fireworks go off. And um, we decided that the uh, we left our coats outside at half past twelve. Yeah. So we decided to go back out, me and two friends. And um, we went back out. We saw, I think it was twelve monks, just floating into the monastery. Really? We, could, we couldn't believe it. Yeah, we we just couldn't believe it. So we ran back inside and told the other people said, look, we just seen 12 people, 12 monks just float across, no legs, their hoods up. Mm. We didn't see who it was. We just we just saw 12 figures floating into the monastery. Weird. And they said, they said, oh, I don't believe you, I don't believe you. So we said, come on out and have a look, come on out. And as we went outside, we didn't see anything. So they said, come on, let's go into the monastery then. So we went inside and we, did, we couldn't see anything. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, we couldn't believe it. They just floated across, floated but straight across the monastery. Again? Out, out, yeah, back out of the door again. Right. Uh, everyone, there's about 14 of us. We all went to stay. We couldn't believe it. Amazing stuff. All right, we're going to give you six of the story and six of the telling. So that's 12. Thank you for that one. Marion is next in Melksham. Hi, Marion. Hello. Uh, this is actually a true story. Okay. Um, when I lived at an old house in Melksham in my younger days, well, teenager days, I used to dread sleeping in my what was my grandmother's bedroom mm. as I used to lie there and a face used to appear through the wall and get larger and larger with horrible sort of piercing eyes, right. a black beard and black curly hair. Well, then I left home, I got married and after 15 years I got a divorce and I picked up with someone else, met his sister and it froze my blood. His sister's boyfriend was the image of the face that I had seen come through the wall. Wow. Uh, I, I just didn't like the person at all. Oh, how weird. Yeah, it was the exact same face. Uh, it was very frightening. That is really kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. And have you ever kind of tried to investigate it or try and work out why? Well, no, because um, I, she did ask me what I thought of him, and I said, I don't like him. I said, There's, I can't explain. I said, you'll think I'm silly, but I said, I just don't like him. Well, he eventually left her, and hmm. he took a car, a caravan, other things with him. Oh, so maybe there was kind of a little bit of a uh, bit of a warning there. Uh, no one knows. It's you yeah. know, it's just uncanny that that his face How was the exact weird. same face as the one that I'd seen. Cool. Okay, so that's great. Thank you for that one. Seven for the story there, and six for the telling, which is uh, thirteen. And lucky for some. <laughs> it might be lucky for you. You never know. <laughs> okay. Th thanks Dave. for calling. Thank you. Bye bye. Hmm. Good stuff. What we are going to do, actually, for everybody who rings in, we are going to put all the names in a hat and draw out uh, a couple uh, who will win some prizes as well. So everybody who rings in, in tonight with a story, no matter what their score, will still be uh, in for a chance of winning a prize, OK? Mm. At the moment in the lead, though, Evelyn has got 14, and uh, Dawn in Bath also with 14. They're both in the lead with their stories. If you think you can come up with a better story than the ones you've heard, or maybe you can tell a story better, because we're really looking for a, a bit of atmosphere in the telling of the story as well. It's calling us from Khan on the line. Hi, Ian. Good evening, Dave. Good evening, sir. You have a story for us? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back about 40, yeah, 40 years, the early 50s. Okay. 
I was in the RAF, stationed in the north of Scotland. And as a young man, I was dating the local uh, young ladies, you know. And one of them lived in the biggest house in the village. And she used to quite often tell us about the friendly ghost. And of course, we laughed at it, being young idiots at the time. And uh, they challenged us, her family challenged us, to spend a night in the house. Right. Now, in this house, there were a grand total of 13 doors, including the front and back exterior doors. All other 11 do uh, doors inside were locked by a normal key. Right. Um, we went in there about 10.30 in the evening. There were four of us. Um, the father took us round and made sure that every door was locked. And we locked him out of the front door and sat in the lounge, got a pack of cards out and started to play bridge. Within five minutes of us sitting down, the lock on the lounge door in which we were sitting, we heard it click over. We tried the door, it was wide open. Mm. Every other lock that we had seen locked 10 minutes previously was now undone. We locked everything up, went back into the lounge, sat down to continue with our game of cards. The dummy hand was on the table and somebody was playing it for us because the cards were moving without anyone being anywhere near them. Mm -hmm. oh, goodness me. We stayed there until somewhere around about seven in the morning when the owners came back. And in actual fact, we had a very good night. It was a devil of a job to beat the uh, ghost on the cards, but um, he kept us running around locking doors, I must admit. How weird. What, is that really true? Or is that, you make it that is one up? absolutely true. Absolutely true. The only doors that weren't unlocked were the two exterior doors. And these cards were just moving on their own? Yeah. Cool. That's amazing. Brilliant story. All right, we're going to give you seven for the story and, uh, and seven for the telling as well, which is 14, which puts you jointly in the lead tonight on our, on our stories uh, competition. Brilliant story there. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Ian, thanks for telling us your experience. Cheers. Bye-bye. Keep uh, listening. Uh, we'll, we'll announce the final winners at the end of the show. Don't forget, everybody who calls in with a story, you name it, go in the hat for a bit of a draw later. Um, okay, but if your stories we're interested in tonight, your ghost stories, true experiences, or fictional tales, or local legends, but you've got to tell them well. That's the important bit. 12 minutes to 11 now. Bristol 298888, Bath 448888, or Swindon 618888, the numbers to call. Uh, Mickey is in Melksham. Hi, Mickey. How are you? Hiya. Okay, you got a story for us? Yeah. Um, I was living in Coventry at the time. I was working in a hotel. Yeah. And I finished work at about 12 o'clock. Right. And I used to go on the M6 to go home, and it was about 10 miles. Uh-huh. So I started driving. And like, normally it's like really busy at that time, so the trucks and everything, but there's like no cars or anything. So I started going, it was about three miles before I got to my junction to get off. And I looked in the back, looked in my mirror, and there was this um, truck behind me with its lights full on. So I thought, oh, it's all right, it'll like, pass me in a minute. So it kept coming up like behind me, and I could see like the, the shadow of a man like over the wheel. Mm. <clears throat> so he got that close, so I thought, something's gone wrong with my lights, and he hasn't seen me. So I was doing about 80 miles an hour at this time, so I thought, I'm going to have to get off. So I, like, skidded onto the hard shoulder, and I kept going on the hard shoulder, waiting for him to go past me. And as I, like, finally, like, slowed down to stop, there's no... There, he, he didn't pass me. There's no other cars there, and it was just nothing. So I was really shook up. So Weird. I went into work the next day, and I told my, my friend that lives in Hinkley about this, and she said that she'd never heard of that happening on the M6, on the M69, which is just off the M6, mm. there's a juggernaut that goes up and down the motorway and it causes accidents. It's, it's caused about three accidents in the last five years where, like, people have had, like, it's been coming at them. A and haunted they've, lorry. Like, avoided it, tried to avoid it and, like, Ooh. gone off the road. Right. Yeah. Weird. Yep. Weird story. Yep. Okay, well, that's a good one. That's six for the story and six for the telling. Okay, you thought it rather well. Thank you for that. Thanks for calling. Hmm. Haunted juggernauts. It seems you can have haunted almost anything, doesn't it, really? Uh, let's go to Bath, shall we, and speak to Cherry on the line. Hello. Hello. Are you there? 
or is Sherry on a different line? Are you, are you on that line there, are you? Hello, I'm Sherry. on here. I, w I was waiting for my click. There you are. <laughs> right. Well, I, w I want to tell you a true experience, but I'm going to tell you it in the form of a story. Okay, that's great. That's okay. Yeah, do. Right. Well, it was early in the morning of a very cold October day. Max, my young German shepherd puppy, was going berserk at the window. Several times I told him to be quiet, but Max would have none of it and con continued to bark furiously at the window. Eventually, I got up to take a look outside. The garden had a large fence that completely enclosed it, and there seemed to be little chance of anything getting in or out of it. I saw nothing that I expected, but still Max barked and growled at the window. I looked at the clock. It said 8.45 a.m. An hour later, the phone rang. It's me, Mum, a voice said. I'm sorry, love, but Nanny died this morning at a quarter to nine. That was in 1983. Two years later, I was told by doctors that I was completely unable to have children without the aid of IVF. I married John in August 1987, and we had two failed attempts at IVF. I suppose then we just gave up. Gramps died, and then soon after I dreamt he came to me in a dream, telling me to go to a medium. Well, we'd heard of a medium in Telford that was supposedly one of the best in the country. So after a long wait to get to a free appointment, we booked a sitting with her telling her only of my first name, and we set off in the car to Telford. Within minutes of Mum and I being there, she said she was talking to Grampy. She described him down to his height and build, with no encouragement whatsoever from us, and she said she had an important message from him. He says the 9th of December this year is a very important date for you, she said. All your troubles will be at an end on this date. I remembered that a tape recording, a, a tape was recording our conversation, so I didn't worry that I might forget the date. Your nan is here now, she said. She's got a child with her. She says that the child does not belong on the other side and will be returning to Earth. She says the child's name is Maria. Do either of you know of a Maria? Mum and I couldn't even think of anyone with a similar name, let alone a child. Mum and I listened to the tape many times when we returned home, but just couldn't put the pieces together. After a time, the day we'd had with the medium was talked about less and less, and when John and I finally decided to go for adoption, it was all but forgotten. Months passed with several meetings and trips to the social services, until finally we were accepted. The wait then was to hear if we'd find us, if they'd find us a child. Eventually, the phone rang. May I come round with some details of a little girl, said the social worker. Well, she didn't have to ask twice, and when she arrived, John and I couldn't believe what we read. Sex, girl, name, Maria. Date of birth, the 9th of the 12th, 88. We met Maria, and we all took to each other straight away. She's been living with us now for two years. She's an absolute joy, and we all love her as much as if she was our own. But she has this strange similarity to me, and it's quite uncanny. Of course, you know what I'm going to say. I would strongly like to believe that she, my nan, had a hand in all this, and that she helped to become a mum, if not through biology, and that it was her saying goodbye the day the dog went mad. And she's still loving me and supporting me from the other side. And of course, I can't prove any of it, apart from a tape that I still listen to now and again. But I'm sure she's still with me, and it, it brought me so much closer to her on my wedding day when I wore her, wore her golden locket around my neck. That's a wonderful story. That's, and that's uh, absolutely uh, true. I've got a, for a second. I've got a, I've got a tape <laughs> of that today, and I've also got my daughter's birth certificate and her name. Too much there for coincidence, isn't there, really? It it's, is a bit. Uh, that's brilliant. Okay, well, I'm going to give you eight for the story and eight for the telling, because you, you told it superbly well. Thank you. And uh, we, this, I'll push you in the lead at the moment with 16. Thank is, you very much, Dave. Excellent. That's a great story. Thank you for that. Okay, Thanks, thanks for calling us. Keep listening. Um, okay, seven minutes to 11. It's uh, our ghost-telling uh, competition tonight, a ghost storytelling competition. Uh, if you uh, want to tell us a spooky story, Bristol 29, Swindon 61, or Bath 448888 are our numbers to call.